you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn Hamas? Would you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn Hamas? Again and again, Western media asks the typical narrow-minded question. No history and no context. Only a loaded question. A lazy question. One that's supposed to influence with sound bites reinforcing a specific narrative. That Arabs are intrinsically bad and that Israelis are victims. It's not only Hamas, but also any resistance movement that is attempting to gain liberation from a suppressive occupier or colonialist. And no interview can reflect such a void of neutral line of questioning as the short but powerful interview conducted by the Australian reporter Richard Carlton with Ghassan Kanafani, a Palestinian activist. If you want to discover the determination of the Palestinian people, their commitment to their just cause, their defiance, then I suggest you keep watching and save this interview for future viewing. I've put a link to the interview in the video's description. We'll slowly go through the dialogue and analysis, how the content of the interview speaks loud and clear on Western media's attempt to paint a specific and biased picture of the Palestinian struggle, and how it reflects the current times as well as the behavioral entitlement of both Israel and the West, while re-emphasizing the dehumanization of the Palestinian resistance. But first, let us lay the groundwork by establishing the cast members of the interview, by breaking down the antagonist and the protagonist, who they are and what they represent, a Western colonialist raconteur versus a subjugated resistance fighter. Carlton was a television journalist for the Australian Broadcast Corporation. Born and bred in Australia, he would go on to quickly take on board challenging journalist missions. Even before the young age of 27, when he conducted this interview, he was renowned for his arrogance towards his interviewees, as well as his bullying tactics. He would go on to feature in all the global warring hotspots over the next four decades, up until his passing in 2006. This interview, though, is never mentioned by his peers, when his lifetime accolades are listed. Kanafani was a first-hand witness to the El Nekba, when he and his family were made refugees in 1948. He would go on to become one of the most celebrated Arab writers and novelists of his generation, and eventually turned his finely honed linguistic artistry to tell the Palestinian story of injustice within the world of politics. He would join the Popular Front for the National Liberation of Palestine, the PFNLP, and become the editor of its official publication, Al Hedef. Not many were more in tune with the Palestinian struggle as Kenafani, and his loud and penetrating voice would lead to his eventual assassination in 1972. Of the 11 Palestinian guerrilla movements, the most radical of all is the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. It was the Popular Front that hijacked and blew up three jet aircraft at Revolution Airport in the Jordanian desert. The Beirut leader of the Popular Front is Ghassan Kanafani. He was born in Palestine but fled in 1948, as he puts it, from Zionist terror. Since then, he's been plotting the destruction of both the Zionists and the reactionary Arabs. I know what I know Thank really, you. that uh, the history of the world is always the history of weak people fighting strong people. Of weak people who has a correct case fighting strong people who use their strength to exploit the weak. Carlton's first question is a typical one of a Western journalist, even in today's media landscape, jockeying to establish a foundation for a self-serving narrative. But Kanafani recognizes the struggle for context. One wants to judge and put his counterpart in a corner, while the other wants to shed light and establish sympathy. And Kanafani's acumen and sharpness are immediately recognized by Carlton, as we hear his follow-up question. Turn to the fighting that's been going on in Jordan in the recent weeks. It's your organization that's been one side of the fight. What has it achieved? One thing that we have a case to fight for, that's very much. This people, the Palestinian people, prefer to die standing than to lose its case. We achieved, we achieved proving that the king is wrong. We achieved proving that this nation is going to continue fighting till victory. We achieved that our people could never be defeated. 
we achieve teaching every single person in this world that we are a small brave nation who are going to fight to the last drop of blood to put justice for ourselves after the world failed in giving it to us. This is what we achieved. By shifting the flow of the interview from a Palestinian struggle against Zionism to that of an Arab-on-Arab -Arab infighting, Carlton intelligently attempts to catch Kenafani on the back foot. But Kenafani doesn't relinquish his position of power after the first question, and again retakes the offensive by reconfirming an idealistic stance that the Palestinian cause is just no matter what, against any form of tyranny, even if Arab. Don't forget to join the Chronicles by subscribing to the channel. And like it if you do actually like it. And by clicking the notification button, you'll be up to date on all new releases. It does seem that the war, the civil war, has been quite fruitless. It's not a civil war. It's a people defending themselves against a fascist government, which you are defending because just King Hussein has an Arab passport. It's not a civil war. Well, the conflict... It's not a conflict. It's a liberation movement fighting for justice. From context to sympathy, the interview shifts towards a fight for definition and the resultant associations such definitions come with. Carlton intentionally labels the Palestinian struggle as a civil war or conflict. Both terms attempt to push the audience towards sentiment of aggression and violence. Kenafani wasn't having it though. He counters that the struggle is much more honorable and justifiable. Here again, Kenafani appears to win the morality battle. Well, whatever it might be best called. It's not whatever, because this is where the problems start. Because this is what makes you answer all your questions, ask you all your questions. This is exactly where the problems start. This is a people who is discriminated, is fighting for his rights. This is a story. If you will say it's a civil war, then your questions will be justified. If you will say it's a conflict, then of course it's a surprise to know what's happening. Now we begin to witness Carlton's frustration and subsequent weakness. He is being confronted by Kenafani. No freebies, and definitely no whatevers. Carlton's bullying is not succeeding, and he recedes into journalistic laziness by trying to bypass a strong counter-argument made by Kenafani. Not only does Kenafani disallow him to move on with the interview, but he also highlights Carlton's attempt to gloss over the Palestinian struggle in diminishing its true essence and value. Why won't your organization engage in peace talks with the Israelis? You don't mean exactly peace talks, you mean capitulation, surrendering. Why not just talk? Talk to whom? Talk to the Israeli leaders. That's kind of conversation between the sword and the neck, you mean. Kanafani attacks with extreme symbolism, a symbolism that depicts the sword as power, power of the West and Israel, and the neck indicating weakness, exposure, and surrender, and these conditions representative of the plight of the Palestinian people. In several words, Kenafani summarizes the real situation, where Israel is much stronger, supported greatly by the West, while the real victims, the Palestinians, are engaged in a fight for life or death. Well, if there were no swords and no guns in the room, you could still talk. No, I haven't been, I had never seen any talk between a colonialist case and a national liberation movement. But despite this, why not talk? Talk about what? Talk about the possibility of not fighting. Not fighting for what? Not fighting at all, no matter what for. Yeah, and people usually fight for something and they stop fighting for something. So you can't tell me even why should we speak about what? Kenafani's not so subtle message in the use of his analogy of the sword and the neck as the real state of affairs between Zionists and Palestinians is totally ignored by Carlton, and Kenafani makes him pay dearly. A relentless barrage of piercing rebuttals that throw Carlton off balance. He clutches at straws only for Kenafani to whip back with more sharp retorts. Carlton is in a hole. The roles have been reversed, and Kenafani is now the interviewer, and Carlton is the one having to answer the questions. Well, stop fighting. Or, what? Or, or talk about stop fighting, why? Talk to stop fighting to stop the death and the misery, the destruction, the pain. The misery and the destruction and the pain and the death of whom? 
of Palestinians, of Israelis, of Arabs. Of the Palestinian people who are uprooted, thrown in the camps, living in starvation, killed for 20 years, and uh, forbidden to use even the name Palestinians. They're better that way than dead, though. Maybe to you, but to us, it's not. To us, to liberate our country, to have dignity, to have respect, to have our mere human rights, is something as essential as life itself. In the relentless questioning, Carlton has been cornered. He hands Kenefani an opening to make his ultimate statement. When all is lost and there is no hope, death is cheap. No home, no belonging, no identity, no rights, and no nation. What is left but to resist for the Palestinians? What else can be said? And Carlton realizes that he has lost, and yet again, runs away from the confrontation with a new line of questioning. You call King Hussein a fascist. Who else amongst the Arab leaders are you totally opposed to? We consider the Arab governments two kinds. Something we call reactionaries, who are completely connected with imperialists, like uh, King Hussein government, like Saudi Arabian government, like Moroccan government, Tunisian government. And then we had some other Arab governments which we call the military petit bourgeoisie governments. That's like Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Algeria, so on. Carlton attempts to alienate Kenafani in the viewer's eyes through the use of a divide and conquer strategy to separate the Arabs from each other. Kenafani doesn't back down though. On the contrary, he again projects his brave and realistic perspective. He calls out the puppet regimes of the region and their imperial masters. What was an attempt to divide fails terribly, as Kanafani's words deeply echo the common Arab sentiment. Just to end with, let me go back to the hijacking of the aircraft. On reflection, do you think that is now a mistake? We didn't make a mistake in hijacking them. The contrast. We did one of the most correct things we ever did. Carlton's final and desperate attempt at any type of dominance resorts to an event that will for sure generate anti-Palestinian sentiment by referencing, in Western opinion, a universal and unquestionable act of violence, the hijackings. But his attempt comes and goes, without resistance, but with full acceptance by Kenafani. It was one of the most correct things we ever did, he says. Confident, calm, and pridefully victorious. Based on the Zionist narrative, Kenafani and the people of his identity, educatedness, intellect, passion, and memory, didn't and still don't exist. The Palestinians were a myth that were created strictly for sympathy. Yet just in this one interview, one can feel the raw and immense power of the cause and its righteousness. There is so much to unpack in this one interview. Its brevity is not reflective of its substance. The level of enduring resilience permeates any endeavor to counter its argument. Kanafani's words predict the inequality of the struggle and the false notions that will dominate its debate over its future. Many will try to discredit Kanafani through his association with the PNFLP, a group involved with the hijackings. Those that do, again, fall victim to a false narrative. Whereas Kanafani's only true weapon utilized against his enemies were his words, both the written and the spoken. Much in the same way, Richard Carlton, in his youthful exuberance, fell victim to such inaccurate misrepresentations and narratives, and approached this interview from a perch high above, only to come tumbling down through Kanafani's linguistic magic. And that's why this interview will go on to inspire well beyond Kanafani's time, speaking the truth not only of his people's cause and dream, but of all inequality and abuses, no matter the ethnicity, faith, or geography a truth that is enduring, powerful, and full of justice.